morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about genetic technology. Topic for the day is cloning and stem cells, two very controversial topics. Today, we're not going to worry about getting into the ethics of it, though I'll mention it. We're really just concerned with nuts and bolts. So by the end of the video, here are your objectives, the things that you need to know or be able to do. First thing, describe the process of organismal cloning. So how do you do it? And recognize that it's different than gene cloning, which we talked about previously. Next thing, recognize the limitations of cloning. And finally, explain the concept of a stem cell. It seems like a simple objective, but we're going to spend a couple slides talking about it. So first topic for the day is actually going to be cloning, and it's all about nucleus transfer. Now let me talk about things being different. In a previous video, I talked about gene cloning, where you isolate a gene, stick it into a plasmid, which you stick into a bacteria, and then as that bacteria divides, your gene gets cloned over and over and over again. This time, we are talking about making all new organisms that have got like identical genetic material. So the process is actually a fairly simple process, and you can see it over on the right-hand side there. Essentially, what you do is you take an egg cell. Here's our egg cell. You hold it on the end of a little suction tube, and you take a hollow needle, and you suck out the nucleus. So after this step right here, you're essentially left with an empty egg. It's got the cytoplasm and all that, but it doesn't have a nucleus in it. Next thing you do is you take a skin cell or some other cell from the body that's got a full set of genetic material. Diploid number, in our case, would be 46, though we're not usually talking about humans when we're talking about nucleus transfer. But you're taking a nucleus out of a cell that has got a full set of genetic material. Take that nucleus, put it into your egg that you have just emptied out, induce it to divide, and most times it will actually go through and divide into a full organism. Because you remember we talked about each of your cells has got all of the instructions in it needed to complete to build a completely new you. So that's the basic process of nucleus transfer. You're taking a fully full nucleus from a diploid cell, sticking it into an emptied out egg, inducing the thing to divide, and hopefully, if all goes well, getting a new organism. Now, there are some limits to cloning. On the right-hand side there, you see Dolly. Dolly is famous because she was the first clone of a mammal. Now, since they have been able to produce clones of cows and sheep and dogs and cats and frogs and all kinds of stuff, they've gotten really good at this, um, I don't know, I guess method of cloning through nucleus transfer. They have found that there are problems, though. Dolly, for example, died at age six of complications with her lungs. All the way throughout her life, she also had arthritis. Um, they've found that fairly frequently with with clones. The cloned animals that are actually born do have health problems. Um, there's also a low efficiency of cloning. So you can make a whole lot of embryos before you actually get one that will stick and develop all the way through to birth. The reason that they think that clones have so many health problems is the nucleus that is being put into the egg is taken from a cell that is already differentiated, which means that the DNA in that cell has been modified. Now, when they pull that nucleus out, they're able to reset some of that, but not all of it. So it's kind of like you're taking old DNA and sticking it into a brand new cell. So in a lot of ways, these clones seem as though they are prematurely aged, and that might be because the genetic material you're sticking in there has already been sort of differentiated, and then they tried to roll the clock back, but the clock didn't go all the way back. So that's kind of all we need to talk about with cloning. Let's go ahead and jump into stem cells. Now... <laughs> Stem cells are really exciting because they are like blank slates. They are what is known as a pluripotent cell, which means that they can become any type of cell. And that's why they're exciting is because scientists think, hey, we've got these blank slates. If we need to do repair work somewhere, maybe we can get those cells to turn in this, into the cells that we need for this repair work. Now, what are they good for? <laughs> There's a lot of things that they can be used for, and there's another slide down the road that I'll talk about later, but essentially there's kind of a couple of broad categories. One, you can take those stem cells and just grow cultures of these cells that are undifferentiated if you want to study things like development. You can also take those cells that have yet to become anything and induce them to become things. So like a fully blank stem cell could be, if grown on the right medium, turned into a blood cell, could be turned into a bone cell, skin cell, eye cell, brain cell, nerve cell, take your pick. Grown on the right medium, a stem cell can be induced to become 
any other type of cell. So obviously that's really exciting for like repair of injuries or nerve damage or you know just basic research. If you get this cell that you can turn into anything else, you've got a very malleable thing that you can do some work on. And it's also obviously exciting for medicine when we think about things like diabetes and <clears throat> let's say getting some new um, outlet cells to produce insulin. Now, there are two types <clears throat> of stem cells, and this is where we get into a little bit of the controversy. There are embryonic st stem cells and adult stem cells. Embryonic stem cells, essentially what they do is they take a sperm and egg, so here's our sperm, they use that to fertilize an egg, and obviously out of that you get a zygote, now that zygote will develop <clears throat> until it gets to a phase called the blastula. And the blastula essentially is a ball of stem cells. Um, in the blastula stage, this ball of cells, each of the cells is a stem cell, which means that each of these cells could go on to become any other sort of cell. Embryonic stem cells are the preferred stem cell to work with because they have the potential to become literally any type of cell. There aren't any limits on them. Adult stem cells, in our adult bodies, you can find stem cells in the teeth and blood vessels and the liver, you can find them in bone marrow. Problem is they aren't as malleable. They have limits on, to, on what they can become. So like <clears throat> stem cells found in blood marrow, they can become any type of blood cell, but it'd be really tough to get them to become a skin cell or an eye cell or something like that. So embryonic stem cells are better, they're more malleable. Problem is there's an ethical consideration because you are forming an actual embryo. You're fusing a sperm and an egg, which means that that embryo could, if put in the right situation, like implanted in a uterus, become a baby. So obviously that's an ethical consideration there that a lot of people have a problem with. Um, when they are producing this sort of embryonic stem cell, obviously it's not for reproductive purposes. They never implant it in a mother. It's all carried out in the lab. But there's still that consideration of where does life begin and how does all that play into this idea of we're making embryos for scientific research. Now, I talked a second ago about all of the things that they can be used for. There's one thing I want to highlight, stem cell therapy. That would be the idea of using them for medical purposes. So let's say somebody has got some nervous damage. It would be really cool if you could grow new nervous tissue too repair that damage because normally nervous cells within our bodies don't repair themselves. So know that a lot of medical therapies are being looked at for possible, um, I guess, application of stem cell technology. And this is the last thing that I want to talk about. Um, some research has been done recently about using a adult cell and essentially turning the clock back on until it was like an embryonic stem cell. A second ago, I talked about how the adult body has got stem cells in it, but they're kind of differentiated into categories, like they can become cells within that category, but they can't really cross out of categories. Um, teams of researchers have been able to produce IPS cells, which are induced pluripotent cells, and essentially what they do is they take an adult cell, and they've been able to roll the clock back on it until it is like an embryonic stem cell. Now, it's a very difficult process. Um, they are making progress moving forward, but it's not nearly as easy to do as just you know making an embryo and harvesting embryonic stem cells. So know that there are researchers working on this workaround to where they can produce uh, stem cell lines that are like embryonic stem cells without actually producing an embryo to harvest those cells. So no cloning and stem cells, very excellent, very interesting applications of genetic technology. Both have got their own ethical issues. Um, and as we go forward in your lives, you're going to see these debates come up a lot, so it's good to be aware of them. I hope that this little tutorial was helpful for you. Thank you for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and hopefully we'll see you again.